We have one brave man tonight with us. Yeah, great. <laughs> Mr. Fonick. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Franz, hi. <laughs> maybe he's not the only one, but maybe you don't see all of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. So is it people are coming in, I suppose, Lily. Hmm? People keep coming. I okay. There's still more to admit. We uh, I've started recording. I've started live streaming. I will just now put the program on the screen. And shall we? <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's okay. It's also nice to see each other. <laughs> Yeah. So, shall we start in a minute? You can go as you please. You're online. Uh, you're online. Okay. People are still coming in, but you can start here. Yeah. Basically, yes, okay. give introductions. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. So, dear ladies, we said we are a big coffee table today. Maybe the coffee table has to accompany up to 100 persons at the end of the evening or the end of another 10 minutes. We want to welcome you uh, to our first meeting of Women in Peace, Building and Conflict Resolution. We are a team in Vienna, Maria Riel, Irmgard Mentler, many of us know us. And we said in this time, even everything is going down, is closing down, but still, how can we be active? And as Women Federation, one of our really main and favorite topics always is how can we help that conflicts can be solved long before the violence is coming? The other reality is that violence is happening, wars are happening all over the place in a smaller or bigger scale. And then when the war is finished, then again, how can we rebuild the communities? How we can we rebuild uh, com uh, communication and the relationships among people? So actually around Easter time, it came to all of our minds, uh, Mrs. Silke Spahic, Professor Spahic mm -hmm. in Sarajevo, because for us, she is a lady who is exemplary in this field, in conflict resolution, in strengthening women, helping women to become stronger, to build up themselves, their community, their families. And so we said, okay, let's start with her and build a program around this. So we are very happy to welcome you all to the first evening of Women Federation in Vienna, uh, Women in Peace Building and Reconciliation. Uh, we will have four speakers. I will explain a little bit the program for you. We will have four speakers and after the speakers, uh, we will have a question and answer session. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. There is the chat box down on the screen. I'm sure you're all very familiar with Zoom meetings by now. Put your questions and also write if you want to put forth the question to a certain person. Our colleague Irmgard Mentler will take care after the speakers have finished. And then also we thought there are so many ladies actually we are ladies from different countries in Europe, but we are also ladies from countries in Middle East. And because I was, my name is Renate Amesbauer, I forgot to introduce myself, I'm very sorry, because so many friends already know me. I am the leader of Women Federation in Austria, and I also did the registration. So you know me by name, you know my email address also. So uh, we know that many of you also have experiences and programs and projects and organizations so we said maybe for we thought for 15 minutes, we want to make a breakout session. So we are in smaller groups. So in this time you can exchange among your smaller group. And uh, then at the end, we can come back with solutions, with ideas, with inspirations from these groups for another 15 minutes. And then we close with a roundup of the speakers, a closing up of all the speakers. We will explain some more details on the way. And Lily and Irmgard will remind me if I forget something very important. So we really want to start with our first speaker, uh, Mrs. Caroline Hanshin. She will give a short, short introduction, words of greeting. Mrs. Hanshin 
We are very happy. Her husband is from Swiss, so she is. She was. She came to uh, Europe. I don't know how many years ago. Twenty years or something. We are very grateful that she is in the reservation. She is our international president of the UN offices. All of them: Vienna, New York, and also Nairobi, and of course Geneva. So we are very happy for the cooperation with her. She is very bright, spirit, open-minded. And I think our, yeah, Austria and Europe always needs a little bit of American spirit to revive ourselves. So I'm very, we are very happy and grateful that Caroline, you're with us today. So please, we ask you for your words of introduction, words of greeting. You have the floor. Caroline? Yeah. So far, you see, Lily. Lily, unmute. No, we see. Where is that? You see, Caroline? Oh, yeah. Caroline, Caroline, we cannot hear you. Lily, you have to help Caroline. She cannot come in. She cannot unmute herself. Mm -hmm. Lily? Tony Cook. Now. Now, now it's working. It's working now. Caroline, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Sorry. hello everyone. Uh, from my Women's Federation office in Switzerland, in Lausanne. Thank you for this opportunity to say a few words before we begin this important debate. The theme peace building and conflict resolution as Renata said, has always played a strong part in our agendas and in the work of the Women's Federation, grassroots program, and in our advocacy. There are three other steps towards sustainable peace that we usually include too. That is reconciliation, education, and engagement towards sustainable development, as I'm sure we will hear more about tonight. This topic is so important because it touches our lives every day with our loved ones. Just today, this afternoon, I mediated a conflict in my kitchen with three of my daughters that was escalating rapidly. And they sometimes help me too in my uh, little conflicts and skirmishes. <clears throat> I have participated in so many hours of debates about tragic human rights violations and conflicts at the Human Rights Council in Geneva. I discover over and over again that when I come back home to my family as mother and wife, my real peace building training and my report card are waiting for me. Successes there or lessons learned always empower me and give me hope to go back again to the United Nations. The principles to build peace between nations, peoples, or individuals are the same. People who cannot make peace in their closest surroundings cannot speak peace very convincingly in public or design peace plans that will hold. Women's Federation will continue to highlight this topic until we discover how to live in peace as a global family to liberate the goodness in and the connectivity between people, which we are so convinced begins in our families and in the models of peace leadership that parents show. The strength of our advocacy at intergovernmental institutions lies in our grassroots programs in over 120 nations and the changes we have made in our own lives in committing to such a vision and goal. Finally, our speakers today, each one, are all not only knowledgeable, but admirable. They are all women of integrity whom I know, who love and sacrifice for humanity, which gives them an authority to speak about peace convincingly and to convey hope for peace and for lasting solutions. I look forward to these uh, discussions tonight. Thank you. And thank you very much to Women's Federation Austria and the UN office for preparing this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Manchin. 
We continue with our next speaker, who will be the main speaker of today, uh, Professor Dr. Silke Spahic Silak. And actually, the lady who brought her to us is Maria Fronek. She is also with us today. She is a Croatian Spahic in Sarajevo about, I think, two to three years ago. We were always very inspired about your work, Silke. It inspired us from the beginning. and if because of distance, we could not visit as much as we, could, we wanted to. But we had also the, the, the luck, we were lucky that last year, at the end of last year, we had a conference in the Balkan, in Tirana, in Albania. And, and Professor Spajic was one of the speakers, so we could meet there and also get a few, a woman of heart, a woman of vision, in an area where it is very, complicated to live and to help people to make good relationships again. So, dear Professor Silke Spahic, the floor is yours. Thank you, Renate. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Salam, Shalom from Sarajevo. I'm really glad and honored to be with you tonight and to meet new friends and to see some old friends. And I'm really grateful, especially to Renate, who communicated all of this, and she's really uh, dedicated to, to peace. <laughs> so as we agreed, um, I will be talking about the role of women in peace building. This is my topic, uh, and uh, I will cover it from two angles. One is uh, the role of women as mothers, and uh, the other is uh, how and why to couple women's peace building uh, with sustainable development. Um, I hope I will uh, keep up with the timing, 15, 20 minutes. If don't, please stop me. So when we speak about peace, uh, it is uh, what is prerequisite to lasting progress and sustainable development on our planet uh, is that both women and men understand the challenges, but also responsibilities to build peace together. Not occasionally, not for one day, not even for one month or for one year, because peace is a process, a path, and we are the travelers. And we need to seed peace of peace every day, with every breath, with everything what we do. It is not easy. But if we really want peace, we need to work for it and we need to invest in peace and not to expect someone else to do it for us. Most people do not bother what's going on around the world because we as human beings are negligent species. We tend to forget because forgetting is a kind of a strategy to survive and live, but it is living in oblivion. Yesterday, I had a, a chance to talk to a few of my colleagues from uh, U.S. university professors who are outraged with the latest development in U.S. and then we tackled the topic of peace. Uh, and uh, we concluded basically that if we think of peace as something that is relevant only to our own community or our own country, then we miss the point. If we pretend that conflicts and turmoils in other parts of the world are not our business. We are not aware of the fact that similar can easily happen to all of us. Because democracy, human rights, and peace building are the concepts that are very, very fragile. So if we think of peace as, as a, a byproduct or as a project, then we will have something like interrupting radio waves that from time to time give us a good news, hope and encouragement, and then disappear. Therefore, I think of peace, or peace for me is a way of life, or as one of the women peace builders from Bosnia used to say, it is a calling. As human beings, we all have a calling, and sometimes due to different reasons, we are not able to discover what our calling is. Sometimes we listen everything else and everyone else except ourselves. Other people sometimes also can help us to be awakened and to learn 
what, are supposed, what we are supposed to do in this world. So groups like yours, Women uh, Federation, uh, and then the uh, other groups can encourage and give a sparkle to start our peace work. But first of all, let, let's see what is peace building? What is peace work? How we defined it? How we understand it? So you probably read many scholars try to define it, but uh, peace building should be understood as a kind of umbrella term or meta term that include wide range of activities. And it can be anything to bring justice, to prevent violence, to affirm women's human rights, but also to work for the well-being of humankind. Uh, when we come together, like tonight, to discuss how to initiate something which will help individuals or, or groups, we are building peace. When we uh, help students to finish their colleges, we are building peace. When we enable women to start their own businesses to support their families and in local communities, we also build peace. When we write a poem or a story which will kindle uh, the, 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 the sparkle of love, compassion, empathy, uh, and then uh, move people to stand for human beings in need, we also build peace. When we serve as uh, 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 to, to, to gather people uh, for events like this, for instance, like our Renate, uh, this is also peace building work. When we listen to each other to alleviate pain, at least for a moment, we are building peace. When we stand against racism, fascism, anti Semitism, Islamophobia, sexism, we are building peace. When we wake up in the morning and decide to make a small changes during the day that might be to smile at someone or to send encouraging note to someone, we are building peace. And I can go on and on. So for me, peace is a way of life. And if we make decision to be on peace path, then everything what we do will be counted as peace building work. I will just mention one of the famous scholars, John Paul Lederach, uh, who, who uh, argues that for peace building, the most important thing is relationship. So relationship is the basis of both the conflict and its long-term solution. Women have long experience in building and rebuilding broken relationships. And I'm aware of that in the uh, conflict and post-conflict context, context of the Balkan and Bosnia and Herzegovina. So uh, they were the one to give the voice to voiceless, powerless, and marginalized groups of uh, uh, citizens. So women in this region and in other post-conflict areas uh, recognized the relevance and importance of relationships. They are crucial, not only at personal level, but also at societal level. Uh, women all around the globe uh, also possess something what uh, Lederer calls moral imagination, which is necessary to envision something that is uh, unknown and unseen. So the moral imagination arises the capacity of ourselves to imagine relationships, the willingness to embrace complexity. Uh, and it also means that human beings are capable of imagining the world and relationships that transcend any polarity, domination, and divisions. For instance, to imagine that we are all brothers and sisters on this planet and behave in that way. But when we try to do that, and we, when we do that, we will inevitably become caught between cultural, social, and religious norms that dictate our life and stigmatize those who want to work and live outside of the box. So thus, moral imagination brings women to moral dilemmas when deciding to go against their own communities to protect, a, to protect someone's life because uh, uh, lives in conflict uh, zones are in, in danger and it requires uh, women and men, to make moral choices, whether to say something against your own community and tradition and stand to, to, for justice, uh, stand for instance, like today, for immigrants, uh, for women, for disabled people, people of color, and all of those who are marginalized. So in confronting their own communities 
women employ different strategies to protect other lives and dignity. And many researches, including my own in the Balkans, Shining Humanity, Life Stories of Women Peace Builders, that was published in 2014, uh, designate women as the key leaders in le their local communities. They built peace in local communities and, and men negotiated it at, at the highest level of decision making. So women are more involved in peace than men, particularly at local level, because their traditional and social roles allow them to be less bound by conventional definitions of security and military necessity. And they also had access to people in local communities to create networks, to communicate, and also uh, they have opportunities to acquire new skills and, and, and uh, work uh, to help others. And as I mentioned, I will uh, briefly tackle the, 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 the role of mothers and, and motherhood as a concept. So motherhood is closely linked with peace building. And as one of the authors, Sarah Rudik, warns and then uh, all of us is to try to make proper linkage uh, because maternal uh, thinking is part what she calls of rationality of care, meaning that uh, women are attentive to the needs of others and they behave in that way to protect and support others. But as she explains, both women and men can employ and can have maternal thinking in the public realm. If they do so, they will not risk the nurturing of their children at the expenses of victory of their nation. It, however, depends how we socialize women and men. If we only socialize women to care and to be compassionate, and we don't do the same with men, men will not be able to exhibit the maternal thinking ethics. Uh, so these caring qualities are not exclusively female, men can only be caring human beings, compassionate human beings. And uh, uh, care-oriented uh, ethics is also closely related to, to uh, uh, the concept of uh, compassion and justice developed by some other scholars. Uh, feminist ethics of care and ju justice pay more attention to care and justice as mutually interdependent. Uh, I'm sorry, interdependent. It is important, uh, as they explain, to break this logic of domination hierarchy, to uh, replace it with compassion and care. And care ethics employed by women is about attentiveness to suffering, active listening, quick responding. For instance, as I've experienced here in, in Bosnia during and after the war, women really quickly responding to everything. They didn't wait for some hierarchy or someone to resolve or to issue the document or something. They just picked the phone and resolved the issue. So they want to do it now if there is urgent need. Uh, but um, as, as Scholars explain there is a tension and, and dichotomy between proponents of justice and proponents of compassion. And that uh, uh, tension need to be overcome. Uh, it's good, as they say, if we try to merge compassion uh, with our search for justice, equality, human rights, and in general, when we address uh, the needs of people. So the women I studied have embodied the concept of compassion as an important part of ethics of care and justice that they practice in their own communities. Some of them have even essentialized Bosnian women as, uh, Bosnian women as special human beings, able to surmount the highest barriers for the sake of their own families and communities. Some of them believe that women are not inherently peaceful but they, that uh, their socially constructed gender roles have made them more oriented to peace because they are socialized to communicate more, to build relationships, to take care of children and, and others in their communities. So the question for all of us is to discuss how we anticipate women's role in peace building and how to avoid gender essentialism. So we, we will have a chance during the break to do it. 
Now I, I would like to uh, read uh, uh, a really uh, great poem that, that uh, um, inspired me and I believe some uh, other women. The poem is about mother. Peace is a woman and a mother. How do I know peace is a woman? I know, for I met her yesterday on my winding way to the World's Fair. She had such a sorrowful face, just like a golden flower faded before her prime. I asked her why she was so sad. She told me her baby was killed in Auschwitz, her daughter in Hiroshima, and her sons in Vietnam, Ireland, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Rwanda, Bosnia, Kosovo, Sudan, and Chechnya. All the rest of her children, she said, are on the nuclear black list of the dead. All the rest, unless the whole world understand that peace is a woman. A thousand candle, candles then lit in her starry eyes, and I saw angels bearing a moonlight message. Peace is indeed a pregnant woman. Peace is a mother. And I hope you, you, you like the, 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 the poem because it, it really reminds us what is, what is important. Now I will skip to the second part of my presentation. And I'm gonna say something about women, women's peace building and sustainable development why we need to speak about both and why we need to cap uh, to couple the 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 the, the two things uh, one of the reasons is that there is no sustainable development without peace and also there is no peace without sustainable development very often when you try to go to local communities and speak about human rights peace speak about uh, peace building conflict resolution uh, women who do not have basic needs for their families don't care so much because they are preoccupied to provide for their families. So that's why we need to couple the two things to help women to provide for their families and then uh, to engage in peace building. If we only empower women economically, invest in their businesses, etc., and do not include peace dimension, we will miss an opportunity to build sensitized individuals for community needs and development. If we will promote peace without viable economic support and development, women will eventually get tired, as they are in many communities. And peace will remain just a nice narrative that doesn't yield co concrete results. And it's happening with all of these projects we've been working on. So that's why UN Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security is a good international legal tool. Um, adopted in 2000, uh, uh, this res resolution uh, has specific gender impact in armed conflicts um, and how uh, they affect women and young girls. And also uh, it speaks about the role of women in peace building in broader sense. It keeps focus on gender equality, peace, and security. Uh, and also it opens possibility to question traditional forms of security and militarism. And finally, uh, 1325 mobilized women around the coast to be more focused on different approaches in peace building and security because we need innovative approaches. We cannot all, uh, always apply the same approach so we need to be creative and innovative. So uh, uh, this resolution also uh, gives opportunity to women to be included in decision-making positions. So to advocate more for, for that. This is uh, one more tool to help us with that uh, uh, in, in, in national, with national legislation and in national communities. Uh, very often we get questioned why women need to be involved in peace building uh, in all stages. There are many reasons and I will just mention some. Because women are affected by conflict and thus by peace agreement uh, in different ways than men. 
Then the second reason is fairness. If we have 22% of female population, there is no justice without women included in all decision-making processes and creating policies. The third, presence of women. When women, are, when women participate in peace building and in other processes, it makes difference in terms of understanding the roots of conflict, but also in, uh, in terms of bringing some practical matters on the table, like education, health, and everything what one community needs. Uh, but mere presence of women doesn't guarantee gender equality. To have gender equality, we need to have uh, gender conscious women and not what we call honorary men on high positions. Very often we have women who climb on the ladder, social ladder, and they uh, uh, become leaders, but they are not gender sensitive leaders. They don't care what's going on with other women. Uh, so they, they uh, that therefore we need gender sensitized uh, women uh, and not only women. So economy, one minute, one minute. Economy yes. and peace are really intimately linked, uh, and uh, we uh, can use some EU uh, guidelines, you know, to 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 work on responsibility for development and also for gender equality. Uh, it's important because uh, it provides decent livelihoods. When people learn, uh, earn enough, uh, they live in dignity and they are treated fairly, uh, they, they, they can give more. Then social capital, when people can accumulate economic assets, they can also invest and improve their own lives and the lives of their communities, and etc. etc. cetera. Et cetera. So, uh, uh, our own experience from this context tells us that when we try to couple the, the economic development and sustainability and peace building, we had great success. And we have projects developed here that, that can speak uh, for it. And if we will have uh, time, we can discuss it uh, in details and I can bring some, some examples. But since time is over, I will stop. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Silke, Stahic, very interesting points. And I'm sure there will be some continuation on these topics that you raised. Now we want to continue with our young speaker, youngest in the circle, Mrs. Ms. Lale Ashwafi. We know her only a few months. Ms. Ashwafi is from the background Russian and from Iraq. She has a mixed Iran. Iran a mixed cultural background and herself, she has been in different countries as teacher and in other functions. She's always telling me a little bit. She's our intern in the Women Federation since uh, 2020, beginning of 2020. And she's studying international relations and uh, peace building and relationship building is one of her focuses. And she said also she has been in the Balkan region. So, we ask now Ms. Arashi Ashrafi to share her insights with us. Please, Lale, it's your turn. Uh, hi, everybody. First of all, I'm so, so grateful and thankful to all of you to giving me this chance, being here and just sharing my, my views and visions. And thank you, Renate, for giving me also this platform to talk. Well. Um, our deal, Silka, wrapped up everything in very, very comprehensive uh, speech, and I can't add anything more to that. But the very um, important thing, first of all, when we talk about the role of women in peace building, the thing that I always, because I'm also coming from a country, half, half of me is from Iran, and we were in, in war for eight years with Iraq. And we experienced the, the hardness of war and the role of women in the peace building after, after war and during the, the war happening. So when we talk about the role of women in peace building, first of all, the responsibilities of women who are directly involved in the war, I would say is a bit different from responsibility of women that they, 
they are a bit far from the war zone and they, uh, they, can, ta they can help in different ways. So, but the only, the, there are some things that these two groups have in common. The very first thing is the, uh, the power of community that women have because my, my focus is the civil society actually. The community that women have, and, and I'm just talking about those tiny, tiny communities that you make with your neighbors, including five or six women. First of all, it's so undeniable in terms of building your uh, confidence. I just want to share an interesting, um, story about East Timor in 2001. There was an election for a parliament in East Timor, a tiny part of the world. And then we know that the role of women is not significant in that part. But in the end, 27% of, pe uh, of people voted into parliament <clears throat> were women. And when people got so, and it's so extraordinary in that part, and people, became so curious that how that happened, they realized that some of the women from East Timor went to Australia as refugees to, you know, build better life or something. And often they could come back to their local communities in East Timor. And by just transferring the confidence that they could regain in another Western world, that the role of women is a bit more, you know, considered to, the, to their own local people, they increased the confidence among people in that area. And then women finally got to the point that, okay, if you could do that, I can do that too. And it just reflects the, the undeniable power of the community among women. And imagine women in these communities are mothers, daughters, single women that, that they would you know, go on and, and go to other communities and spread this confidence. Also, another power of the community of women, and not only community, every single woman is monitoring, I would, I would call, monitoring of implementation and all of all these conventions that we always talk about, that we also take them as framework of some uh, decision-making policies, or the politicians and everything. And the thing is, because women as mothers, they can monitor the kids, what they learn at schools, what they husband talk about at work, what they bring home. Imagine that if, if a mother say that a kid talks about racism or talks about some fascism or something which is not acceptable as a human right, that mother could change it. That mother could reach out to other mothers and say, hey, my, my kid in that school talks about this. What is wrong with the teacher in that school? And it goes on and on and on and on. And, and they can stop things from the very, very beginning. And we know, I'm sure lots of people know stories about that, that, that mothers always said, hey, oh, don't say that. And the kids say, oh, I, I learned that in school. And they could stop that. Second of all, women in, community, uh, sorry, women in communities, they also can influence each other in a way that no one else could influence. As long, what, what is doing with peace? As long as a mother is honorable, honored, and so proud of a son who kills others, or a son who is involved in an activity, I don't, I don't want to, call it a specific name in an activity which is against humanity and the dignity and against against peace that mother could be corrected by other mothers that that woman could be influenced by other mothers and these are the facts that we can't and of course this influence could be you know in a bad way or in a, in a good way she could also spread the bad the attitude or she could also go in a way that changed the attitude. So the fact of the, the, the power of community that women has is undeniable. And I'm sure this is the, the thing that even decision makers are aware. And that's why maybe sometimes, sometimes we see some activities get banned because of the power they are building in communities among women. But 
the role of women also, of course, it could be more than communities and it could be more than tiny, uh, tiny, tiny uh, portions in, in first levels and it can go higher and higher to, to uh, top political level. But the thing is, women, when we talk about role of women in peace building, sometimes something is missing and it's and, and people talk about skills that women have and in this case again it's the matter of education of women in in peace building skills of negotiation skills of addressing uh needs of the society and skills of getting stakeholders and allies on board in order to make a change among politicians is something that women need in, in, in peace building process. Because if we just, we know that uh, the, the policies have been always somehow in a way that women can't find their own way easily. So we sometimes need some allies, could be private sector, could be some other stakeholders or something. But the thing is we don't, we have to learn how to negotiate. We have to learn how to show the other face of peace, which as Silka mentioned, is, is motherhood, is, is the femininity of nature. And this comes back again to education. And education in this case, again, as Silka said, goes to two directions, the basic and standard education that we need in order to go further and further, and the other one is vocational education. When, when women are struggling to meet the end and to survive, of course, they can't, they can't think about their son who is killing another son. They can't think about the kid who is learning about racism because they need to provide bread to survive. So we also, when we talk about role of women, we have to, we have to learn how to empower women so that they can become more and more powerful in peace building. And we, don't, we, we should consider the reform of education and not saying in specific area and not saying specific uh, culture, education needs to be reformed in all cases. The role of um, awareness rising and things in education. These are, these are the things that we have to consider when we talk about role of women. And we see how, yeah, maybe we've been so successful in uh, making communities, in empowering some uh, linkage or something, but how far have we gone in making an education system or raising awareness system among women that could make them more powerful and confident. Of course, this is something that we could, could happen by women, for women, that I think will be even more effective than by men for women because of the, the, the influence that we have on each other. But also, this is something uh, that uh, regardless of the peace and everything we have to think about, and the thing is, the responsibility, why, for example, and, and the other thing that I wanted to talk is the role of NGOs in this case. NGOs could also have some men involved, of course, but some NGOs like WFWP focus on women. And why do we talk about them in, 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 an, NGO, in an NGO like WFWP in Vienna? Because we also, bring all these aspects of confidence, of skill training, of advocacy, and of vocational education that could be helpful in peace building all together. And we make a platform for people that who experience any kind of activities against peace. And they were in, in, in some sort of hard time that could realize the importance of peace. Uh, to to talk about it and to show us what to do for them because at the end women in their own women can find the common language of the field that they live in and that's so important there is no one fit for everything uh, 
I would say, approach. It matter, it, you have to fight for peace in your culture, in the frame of your tradition, and find a common language between your politicians, your civil society. And then you can, you can take it into a, a international and borderless level. So NGOs are uh, like WFWPO, uh, FP is something that could do that and help, help women to find this common language and just share this knowledge if it's from Bosnia and then, okay, what happened in Afghanistan? What happened in Iran? And then we all find the common things and then we all find the, the, the confidence that we need and skills and, and negotiation skills that we need. And then we can rise up all and go to the next level, which is political level. So I think, I think community, w women in, in peace building and their role is so, so fundamental, I would say, because they are mothers and daughters and everything. And, and they, the way that they monitor the society is so different than from how men actually monitor. And they are preventive. So the preventive role of women in peace building is something that we should always focus on because after that, it's too, too hard to say. So I assume Lily is saying that I don't have time. Yeah, time's up, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so I stop here. And, and thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lale. It was amazing. Thank you also that you would bring in from other sites, from other countries, from your own background, because it was very authentic. I have some sign. Yeah, now I see you again. <laughs> It was very authentic what you said. Thank you very much. And it was kind of complimenting the speaker before you. And it's from the bottom of your heart. So we have to really make use of, of you as long as you are staying in Vienna. So we have to exchange mm -hmm. ideas. Thank you very much. Now we come, uh, we move forward to our next speaker, which is our dear friend, Dr. Maria Riel. Dr. Maria Riel, she brought the Women Federation to Austria and she had so much power and so inspiring that many of us really joined in, in the very beginnings, 1992. And uh, Dr. Maria Riel, she's also a general practitioner, a medical doctor by profession. So she's been working with people and trying to help on all levels, many, many people throughout her life. And she will uh, concentrate now on a project and a tool that uh, was created by Women Federation for World Peace, the tool of bridges of peace, how to implement building bridges among people who really have been the history of war behind themselves. So dear Maria Riel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Renate. Thank you, Professor Tilka Spahic. Thank you, Lale. And thank you, Caroline, for the beginning words. Um, today in the morning, I read a word from Martin Luther King. Uh, if, we that if we follow the advices that uh, eye for eye and teeth for teeth, so soon everybody will be without eyes and without teeth. And it touched me very much because it reminded me also in, on my work with uh, people in my office. They are so different and everybody complain about something. And if we want to help everybody, so we need to say, I need it always to say, we peace start with me. I need to concentrate, what is my problem? What is, what is my desire? How can I protect my teeth? <laughs> How can I protect my eyes? How can I protect uh, the richness in myself? And, how, and then how can I serve? How can I, I am in touch with other people? So how we can exchange with each other, our experiences, our knowledge, our, our, our sadness, our happiness, our emotions, our intellect, 
everything what we have. So this was, this is like, I was so much inspired through the talks of my, of the ladies before me. Uh, my, uh, I want to share our special um, ceremony, our special tool about the reconciliation. When we consider ourselves, we are all in somehow post-traumatic situations. Of course, some of us not participated directly in the war. I was also born after the World War II, but now through the pictures coming to our sleeping rooms, we are somehow involved in everything what's going on in the world. So our activities started uh, 25 years ago after the uh, World War II, how to, how to um, stop the problems, what were not these emotional problems still existing between the nations, between the people, even somebody was mentioning this fascism and all these words, what sometimes I don't know what is the internal meaning of it, yeah, because um, is so something to deal with something what was what is behind us in our days yeah so our special technology this bridge of peace started uh, for me personally i went with my daughter this time she was 12 years old and she started to learn english and we went to united states to visit our friends there and i could participate on bridge of peace between japanese in um, and american ladies and i was very touched from this situation uh, you know about uh, it has something to do with atom uh, atom bomb and men were also watching this bridge of peace husbands of these ladies were invited to watch so i will quick i will say these four points of this um, ceremony internal points this is an internal way in ourselves when i ask accept i represent america yeah i feel like american citizen and i decide to from this responsibility or from this acceptance that i am now i represent america i um, see on the other side of bridge it can be substantial bridge or only imaginational bridge um, lady from japan with all living in similar situation like me yes, maybe husband or not but somehow family nobody from us live isolated or without anybody around us and then we um, res we call it respect respect for the other for the situation of others it means i uh, don't put myself like something special but similar we are all we like blue sky so everything what i like i think how it is in other person does she like also music does she like poems? Does she like cooking or dancing or talking with her husband or with her neighbors or with her people around her? And from this respectful um, and interesting uh, attitude in myself, I go to her and in the middle of this bridge, when we meet, we repent internally. Ex uh, through externally we bow to each other it means we say all history is full of wars beyond our desire to live in peace we always somebody started to be not satisfied with something and they could not find any other way just to eliminate the others in the hope then my happiness can be more happy like with the others and we embrace each other in the hope that we will respect and, and 
participate with empathy and with understanding on the life of others. And then we turn to the, to the audience, like showing our determination. We are now internally clear that we want to look for different way of conflict solution, uh, like with uh, war on this, or we call it this uh, capital punishment, like, or like really eliminate the life of the people on this earth. And this ceremony somehow is very touching. When, when, when I participated myself, lots of many emotions are coming. And even men watching these ceremonies, one very important man said afterwards, oh, if Ministry for, for Defense could close this bridge of peace before the war starts, maybe no war could come, could be necessary, because they understood that others have also needs and others are also happier to fulfill their needs on peaceful or practical way. So this is my, uh, this is our experience for many, many other meetings on this bridge of peace, even inviting men and inviting responsible person, if they feel like, oh, is for this bridge of peace ceremony, you don't need any special education generally. Uh, the, the, our desire was our, our studying of our own history, studying of history of Central Europe. Also, my own experience is with the uh, fall down of, of, of mm. uh, Iron Curtain. Originally, I am from other side of the Iron Curtain from communistic part of Europe and uh, from Czechoslovakia. And I was just one month in Austria and watching from outside, listening. This time I had no TV, just radio. So I just listened to the voices from, from Prague. They were telling the soldiers are coming near and near. We don't know how long we can report. Please help us. But because it was like internal situation of a country, nobody could help. So because of law, uh, of the worldwide laws, somehow we were, I was sitting outside and somehow listening only. So this situation teached me how important it is to, uh, to solve the conflict of, of this helplessness. So this moment I felt really helpless and I couldn't, I didn't know, even in Austria, nobody knows what is possible to do. So bridge of peace ceremony, like the women from former enemy countries, when they meet with each other to overcome the hatred, the fear, the helplessness, the like uh, no solution situation, we can find solution through um, our internal decision and through repentance of, of uh, escalation of the conflict. So this is uh, somehow these four big steps is a secret or internal way of changing ourselves. And this is our internal power that we still after 75 years, after World War II, even United Nations were founded. First time with the desire not to protect each other, but no war between each other. Before uh, World War II, we met together only when we wanted to protect each other because of enemy. After the World War II, after World War I, World War II, we saw so many uh, victims and so many, so much pain everywhere in the world, and so much even economical uh, destroyed countries that we decided we want to unite. For what purpose? You know, 
everybody knows, we unite to find a way how to help each other, how to social, we call it socialize each other, that we can understand the otherness and also our own integrity and we can serve each other for higher purpose, for common, common, uh, interdependence or well-being yes well-being yeah for everybody around us mm -hmm. um, so this is the these four key points bring us to the point of uh, the meaning of forgiveness and reconciliation and uh, determination to look for to work for common uh, fundament or common basic um, contracts uh, which are acceptable or which are helpful for people around us and we can start with this in my case is also the same i am now living because of coronavirus i am in this uh, risico uh, this risk group so we are living just ourselves so after many years living always with children with grandchildren we are confronted every day with our otherness yeah how different uh, people we are and how much we uh, the time is good to come together and to and to uh, look for power uh, for happiness to be together and even to wait until the time is over and we can meet again so this is somehow uh, something what i wanted to share and encourage uh, myself and also us to look for this um, secret or this power of reconciliation and and forgiveness and new determination for the future thank you very much Thank you very much, Maya, Maria. Uh -huh. Thank you. And I think it's also like a, a, a rainbow coming back to what uh, Silka said at the very beginning, this, this uh, strong desire that we really want to have in the future, a world that is in peace, a world where every mother can be sure that my children are safe, going yeah. to school, coming back home, yes. and that my sons don't have to be soldiers yes. in any army that we will have a world and also when I was young I had a, I always was collecting pieces of um, uh, po poetry and there was one from a, actually a Russian poet and he said there will be a time when human beings will enjoy to listen to each other and the words and this voice of the other person is music in my eyes yeah, in my ears so I think this is also our Women Federation desire, these bridges of peace we did very much and with very deep experiences in Central, um, Europe. In the Central Europe, but we at international conferences in various, uh, various situations. So uh, now we have listened to really, really profound speakers and I'm asking Irmgard, do we have questions? Or are there no questions? We are still a bit actually behind the time. But anyway, it was very interesting to listen. Irmgard, do we have questions? Irmgard maybe is not mute, unmuted. I don't hear. Uh, Irmgard, you have to unmute yourself. Maybe she cannot do it herself. Sometimes the host has to help. No, it works. Uh, actually, the uh, no question are uh, in the chat, so I don't know. You want to continue or because maybe of then, time reason? Maybe then it would be the time to go in the breakout sessions because maybe the breakout session can help that we get to know some of those people around us now on the screen. So, Lily, we will move into breakout sessions. Uh, Sorry, Renate, I have a question to you Mrs. Have a question. Professor Spajic, especially the situation in the Balkans. Um, okay. So we hear mothers matter. So, um, and it's very important uh, that uh, ethnicity, ethnicity, 
uh, reconciled. So what does what does the woman need in the Balkans um, in the moment? How do you have some project or some wishes, some ideas? So we don't hear you now. Okay. Yeah. Do you hear me now? Yes. yes. That the host, yeah, mute and unmute us, so we are not okay. Now, um, thank you for your question. Uh, I mean, it's it's not easy to summarize everything. Uh, what women in the Balkans need? There, there are so many needs to be addressed, but uh, and there are also so many projects uh, that's been going on. What is important is that the the uh, generation of women who have been working on peace uh, in the last 25 years are getting tired and we need um, younger generations to get involved more yeah. but we haven't managed to introduce uh, peace studies at universities and also in schools and this is something what we really need to work on uh, when it comes to education, because Lala mentioned that, and it is it is important, education for peace or peace education is really important. But uh, uh, also we need to uh, women to get additional skills, especially younger women, to get ad additional skills and also to appreciate what previous generation uh, have done. Mm -hmm. So there is a gap now between those who have been involved in the war and post-war recovery and peace building and reconciliation and generations like Lale and then other young women uh, who are not aware of the situation, what these women have been through and how much they invested in, in peace and how much they have to offer to new generations. So uh, they will not be uh, in situation to repeat some of the mistakes and uh, uh, on, on their uh, path in, 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 in peace because we have formally we have peace in the Balkans but the war goes on but with other means so that's why we need to be attentive and need to as I said at the beginning of my presentation we really need to work on peace every day we uh, as soon as we stop so we can face some uh, of the bigger challenges than those we have. So I would say that we need to uh, invest in education uh, and also need to uh, help younger generations of women to get sensitized for peace work and to uh, be more involved. Uh, and we can do that uh, with informal education it's possible if we don't have a chance to 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 do it through schools and universities we can do it in uh, through informal education and this is one of the ways but also what i think what is important not only for women in the balkans but also for women in in many post-conflict societies is to have uh, uh, either not a project but something bigger either uh, uh, an umbrella organization or the program that will help women to uh, become economically more independent, to, to become economically uh, uh, um, uh, capable to, to provide for their families. Many women in local communities live in poverty and they cannot, cannot provide the minimum. So we need to find a way how to do that. There are some uh, recipes, uh, but uh, we cannot apply uh, every recipe in the same way. We need some adjustments, but we need to find a way how to support these women uh, to uh, build peace in their own communities, but also to uh, preserve dignity, uh, not to give them something as, as uh, you know, humanitarian aid, but to help them to earn it on their own way. So to keep dignity, it's really important. Yes. Uh, humanitarian aid is important, you know, uh, in urgent matters and at the beginning, but 
in order to keep dignity, you need to give them an opportunity to work for themselves, to develop their capacities, and they can do a lot. And we've been trying from 2014 to do it and uh, with three ethnic groups, uh, women uh, from uh, uh, Croatian, uh, Bosniak and uh, uh, Serb uh, women to work together and to develop some of the projects, economic development and peace building together and it works. And we even managed to, to um, work with local communities to reduce taxes on, on, on the businesses they started. So it's possible the, the, to do something, but we need to uh, have bigger support. So far, UN organizations are not interested in that. They invest in something else, but when you say that you wanna invest in women, this is not so much important. And they usually invest in institutionalized, uh, institutional support, you know, to develop institutions, to strengthen rule of law, governance, it's important. But for these kind of issues, there is not so much interest at UN level. And I, I think maybe Caroline and, and, and then some other women who work within the UN system can advocate for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Sabic. Thank you. Um, I just only want to mention just recently I heard from America they have a program about family literacy. So young women ask their mothers, their grandmothers about their life story mm -hmm. and uh, to find out and to respect and honor their mothers and grandmothers mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. they get out something from this for peace building, for reconciliation or what to do better, what not so good. So I found it a very good idea for young people. So, and there's a question for Mrs. Slali. Um, just a minute. Uh, you mentioned the power of a community of women to build confidence and the process to transfer the confidence to people. Example, East Timor, how did they do? It's a question to you, Mrs. Lani. So we don't hear you yet. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Now, yes. Okay, so the story of East uh, Timur was a great, great example, and one of the greatest example of the influence of every single woman on another. That, and it shows the spirituality among us that could be also a, a, a moving um, factor in peace building process. So the story that these people coming from another country uh, with having access to better education, some you know, higher uh, quality of life and sharing it to people that probably because of a lack of education or um, limited access to more information didn't have chance to learn about, they build up the confidence in these women. And then they, they also, they went for further and they built communities and they become somehow the pushing factor in their, uh, in their, in their society. And they got the courage to go for a candidate and they also started their own campaign and they started uh, raising awareness and in the end they also somehow could persuade the government that yes this is what we can offer to you and don't forget again people i mean women can teach each other how to find the common language that they need in order to go further I mean, by common language is negotiation sk skills as well. This is so important that how we, uh, how we speak to the people that we need them to, to hear us. It's so important. And, and these people could influence each other in this way. And, and, and that, that's still one of the greatest examples of the, the confidence and co the power of community in East Timor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can also see one question from Carolyn actually which is a great thing that we should also think about it and it's the role of NGOs actually in this in this case and how they can go for advocacy for peace. 
I always call NGOs as eyes of the society. They always see things that governments don't want us to see. And some people simply can't see. So we are in between and we link the, that, the civil society and the government. So NGOs, maybe sometimes because of the limit power that we have, like WWP, we can't go for a big project or we can't uh, bring, I don't know, skills to a large number of people, but we can always have people as ambassadors. We can always collect some people, some qualified people that we know that they can take responsibility. We can make them uh, this platform, provide them some basic uh, uh, helps that they can learn, they can gain some skills and then come back to their society and build up a, a new community. And they, they can, we can always be um, like a bridge between what is happening and what should happen, which is raising awareness, of course. And I, I think that the best thing that we, ca we can do in this case is getting connected to the field. Because seriously, the real advocacy comes from the field. When, when Zilka talks about the need of women in, in Balkan, this is the most trustworthy uh, source that we have because she lives the life. And she is there. And we as NGO, we can, we can connect people like Silka to people that they need to know. And I think in this case, we, we, we are so responsible. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I give back to Renate. So, um, actually, now I really need to ask my colleagues yeah. because the time has been moving forward. But I think also because we have this really amazing specialists among us that to ask the questions to them was very important. And somehow it took the time of the uh, breakout session. Lily, can you help me and Irmgard? Otherwise, I would say we, we ask the speakers for a close up round or for any last question from the audience because i think to move into breakout sessions now it's making it too long and too because we we considered one and a half hours and i think it is nicer to close up there is ferdinand there is a question from the philippines no, a, comment. a comment or is this just a comment uh, Lily, what do you mean? What do you think? I think we make a close up round. Yeah, if you go right into the close up, then we can record that whole thing. We can still do a breakout afterwards for those who want to, um, but we'll close the live streaming. We can continue the questions on live streaming on Facebook if you go into that now. That would be great. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. is there any other? Closing up round, yeah. So, may I? Is there any other urgent question? Otherwise, I would ask maybe we start with Silka with the close up. Silka and uh, uh, Lale Ma Maria Riel, and then Caroline on the last. Can we ask you for a last word, Silka, Professor Spahic? I think Lily has to open for you the. It, we don't. Okay, do you hear me now? Okay, yeah, so the last word, it, it's hard to give last word. So I don't, I, I don't wanna, uh, my words to be the last one, but uh, thank you all for your attention. And, and it was really privileged to talking to uh, this audience of almost 100 women. And I'm really glad that uh, there is interest all around the globe for these issues. And I uh, wrote on the chat and I recommended, uh, I remember an Austrian artist, uh, Franzi Kreis, who designed a very interesting exhibition, Finding Motherland. 
So I encourage you, Renata, to uh, search for this lady. Uh, and it is an audio uh, exhibition, so you can uh, listen the stories of daughters and mothers and then watch uh, the pictures. So it's really interesting. And we uh, talked about that exhibition to bring it to Sarajevo, but this COVID uh, pandemic stopped us and I hope we'll do it sometimes later. Um, for the last uh, words, I would like to say that um, we all need to uh, give something to receive back. If we don't invest in peace, we cannot expect that we will have peace. It's up, it's, uh, uh, up to all of us to be dedicated to peace cause and to do what we can. If we cannot uh, lead big projects, we can give something small. We can organize small events. We can share some stories. We can make some women uh, visible uh, with work, what they do. Social media are good uh, to, to, to share some positive stories. And I would like uh, also to ask all of you tonight to record your own stories, to make history. Women need their own history because the current history is the history of men. About winners and losers, um, uh, about military leaders, kings and few queens. So women need to record their own stories, their own achievements, what they have done, so the new generation of young women and men can learn what we have been doing here. So uh, please uh, use social media, write blogs, write down your diaries, leave the legacy for future generations. These are my last words. Thank you very much, Professor Silk. No. Thank you. Oh, um, me, yeah, now, uh, you hear me now? Yeah. I want to move on. Thank you very much, Professor Silke, for your encouragement to write our stories and always remember what we did. Sometimes we tend to forget as women. I want to move on to Ms. Ashrafi to give us her final words for this time. So first of all, I just want to thank everybody for, for their time. And again, thank you for giving me this chance. And the thing that I want to say is that we are living in time that communities are not maybe as important as before, but we all know the importance of community, at least among women. So knowledge self-educate yourself try to learn as much as you can and share your knowledge with your neighbor observe your community observe your society and try to share your observation with your community this is i think the very first step for raising awareness and to prevent further dark things happening including war and conflict so this is the very, very simple and fundamental step that we can take as a, as a woman. Thank you again, and back to you, Renate. Yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Ashrafi, for your very great encouragement. And now I want to give the word one more time to Maria Riel, beside me. Yeah, to how to, yeah, my last words, I also, uh, to go deep in ourselves. I think I am reading sometimes the conflict between Cain and Abel, and it reminds me of my own, my own situation and also my family and my people I meet. We meet, uh, some, somehow we meet people, they look more successful like other. And I, I hear, oh, this generation, they are loser. We call it like winner and loser. 
And I feel my role like mother is always to watch and to try to make bridge. Um, the winner are happy, so I can just in, uh, congratulate them. But the loser, they need my encouragement and my attention. How can I support them? How can I pray for them and support them that they ca can find the power to learn to, from the, what we call winner or from the successful people, they look like successful. So my role like mother and even grandmother, when I, when I look at my children, I always looked at them and said, you are so different. You are good, you are like, you, you are so light and other son is like power, you are going through and third son is like, stone he is so heavy yeah so you cannot have a um, competition somehow how to bridge the desire to compete and desire to enjoy uh, our differences and to celebrate our differences and not use the power to compete so this is my desire and my work on it uh, like role of women to help is what we call world of men or, com or competitive spirit. Yeah, so we are we can be all winner <laughs> on the end. Thank you. Thank you, Maya Maria Rie. And I also want to ask Caroline if she has to say wants to share some last idea or last words with us. Please, Caroline Hanshin. Hello, okay. Um, yes, just in closing, um, I just have to smile really because I'm so how I'm so amazed how unique each person is <laughs> and what kind of amazing life experiences we have. And if we can create this environment where we can be free, you know, that our our all of our uh, wisdom and I say I'm amazed by Lale who's so young and yet has already so much wisdom it's really quite amazing and uh, you know this um, I feel especially among women but but not against men at all and but something women who come together to talk about building peace and taking care of their families and communities. There's some very special atmosphere and it quickly becomes very, very deep. Uh, all of the speakers spoke so personally and so profoundly really. And um, I just wanted to suggest so that we have something to look forward to. Our Women's Federation office in New York, the, the UN office, uh, just started, they held one, and Imgard referred to this, they held, held one event on uh, under a new kind of banner that we wanted to continue, and it's called WFWP Perspectives on Peace. You know, our one of our close partners, UPF, is doing peace talks, and then we thought for a while what would be a good title for something, if we want to do something like that and WFWP Perspectives on Peace. So I would just like to suggest that we could do something like this once a month. And we can talk about, we can see what theme or who should be the speakers. We can, everyone can give their ideas actually. We don't, we don't even have to just have speakers who are used to speaking publicly, just speakers who have content and people who have something to say. So anyway, that would be my proposal. So thank you for a wonderful experience, very educational experience too. <clears throat> thank you very much, Caroline. So I think we just made one and a half hours, 90 minutes. 
And I really want to thank all of you who came and who spoke, but I also really want to thank all the ladies who came to listen because there's so many ladies and so much experience in the background that I think without any problem, Caroline, we can make a, a, a circle every month or every week, but every week is too much because yeah. there's so much experience in the background. I know from some ladies wrote me what they are doing, but some didn't, but I know every, actually every woman, as you pointed out, all of the speakers pointed out that each woman as a mother, as a, wife as a daughter has the experience how to contribute to peaceful mm. atmosphere because somehow it's very inside of us that we rather have peace and we find all means to make peace because we don't like fighting i mean i don't like fighting sometimes i'm even lacking the yeah, strength to, to speak <laughs> out for something that's very important so sometimes we have to be strong to speak out but basically we like to make peace and like also Maria said and every one of you also to always remember this uniqueness of every person. We, this is also one point uh, we like so much about, um, appreciate so much about Professor Silke, Silke Spahic, that she's working with all religions and I listened to some of her YouTubes encouraging people to get connected to their vision of creator if the different names to a heavenly creator, to someone, we, we didn't create ourselves. The beautiful world was not created by us. We can make it more beautiful. We can take care of the plants, take care of the cat, take care of animals and take care of each other. This is our task. But basically we're living on this earth already. The earth has been created by someone else. So uh, as Women Federation, we had this long row of conferences on education together with a very good friend also who is uh, who was became very sick and he was on education and each time we cried before we started make, when we made the plan because there's so many children so each person in the world so unique and they can bring out their uniqueness when they have a family that supports them when they have a system they can go to schools they can have a chance to build their abilities. So I always feel we are kind of not living what we are really supposed to live yet. But because of you, actually Lala, you are very encouraging to us and also Silka, very encouraging because sometimes, yeah, you don't know what, how to continue, but I think we will have ideas how to continue, to continue to help that each person in the world can live according to the God-given dignity to encourage each other to exchange. So thank you very much for listening and we will close today. We wish you a very nice evening, but we come back. Also, you can come back with your ideas, suggestions. You have email addresses. I send at least three email addresses with every email. Some are connected with Caroline, some are connected with Sue Bennett. I thank you also for Sue Bennett in the Middle East. Some ladies are connected with her and they joined the Zoom call today. And in each country, I know from Belgium, I know from the Netherlands, from France, from Italy. So please go back together also with your women federation leaders and make your plans and come back to us with ideas, uh, respective to Caroline Hanschinger. Thank you very much, my dear ladies. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. I think to make it a successful event. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> Thank you, Thank everybody. Thank you. So nice to see you all. Yeah. Let's see you again. <laughs> see you. Thank you, Tony. So Thank you. Can, you can put it like that again. You can see all the people. Okay, we've stopped live streaming. We're still recording. So, Renata, if you want to finish, then I'll stop the meeting or just stop the recording. Yes. Thank you, Lily. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's so we have it filled up with it. our with so beautiful ideas and ex experiences. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lily. Okay. Thank you, Lily. And thank Tony. You, Lily. And Tony. Yeah. yeah. Okay. End the meeting. Bye. Bye.